the final segment of my interview with Dr. Ramesh Thakur in a moment. But first, one of my favorite stories this week was the utter hypocrisy shown by the Prime Minister and his Energy and Climate Change Minister, Chris Bowen, as they took two separate jets to an event on, wait for it, national vehicle energy efficiency. Channel 7 reported on it this way. Anthony Albanese, the climate change minister and industry minister under fire for taking two RAAF jets to this renewable energy announcement. There was actually like a 6.45 direct Canberra to Newcastle link flight for 200 bucks. Outrageous. They left Canberra for Scone last Thursday, less than half an hour apart. As you know, the Prime Minister always travels uh, with the Royal Australian Air Force, all Prime Ministers have for living memory. The runway at Scone wasn't strong enough to take the last jet, so the Air Force recommended and took the decision for two small jets. Yeah, nothing to see here, folks. What's the matter with you? Channel 7's Isabel Mullen reporting there, and she tied the story quite rightly to the drop in support for the government in the polls this week among young people. Down five points, the coalition gaining ground. Labor still ahead overall on a two-party preferred split. And that's for voters aged 18 to 34, the young who usually overwhelmingly back Labor. So why was the PM even at that vehicle charging station event? Isn't this Chris Bowen's baby? Well, some have speculated that the PM wanted to bask in a little of the limelight, you know, the great virtue signalling limelight that the kiddies love so much when it comes to charging stations and electric vehicles, and take a little of the shine off Chris Bowen. So he tagged along in his own jet. Nice. All that carbon emitted for the sake of a bit of good PR. Now, you know, I don't really give a rat. So I think the Prime Minister should be able to fly anywhere he wants in the country at any time he wants. It should be a right that comes with the top job, and it's needed for security reasons, of course. In the US, the President gets a huge passenger plane, Air Force One. Bowen and the rest of them could have taken the commercial flight. But even an occasional Air Force jet for them is fine, too. The problem here is the hypocrisy and the idiotic moral grandstanding that we all have to put up with about climate, climate, climate being such a crisis. Well, it's not so much of a crisis that we can't fly a couple of jets, and it's not so much of a crisis that we can't ban nuclear power. So just how much of a crisis are we supposed to believe it is, really? A new UK poll published in London's The Telegraph newspaper says one third of scientists, scientists, believe that government officials focused only on a minority of opinions in managing the COVID response, wrongly equating healthy scientific scepticism with science denialism. In the final segment of my interview for this week's episode with Dr. Ramesh Thakur from the Australian National University, we discuss how the media and social media censorship created a false sense that sceptical scientists were vastly outnumbered by others when they were not. He says this caused them to self-censor and not speak out to question the majority, which had serious negative effects being felt even today. Dr Thakur says the scientific community must understand this error and work to ensure it doesn't happen again. Ramesh, one final uh, report uh, that we didn't mention was the poll data from the UK. This was a wide-ranging survey conducted by the Telegraph newspaper and Census Wide and published in March that found that 33%, one-third of scientists, scientists, believe that officials had focused only on a minority of opinions, I love this line, wrongly equating scientific scepticism with scientific denialism. In other words, accusing people of being scientific deniers when in actual fact we were just being sceptically healthy, healthily sceptical. Yep. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because it ties in with two other things that are important to remember. Uh, but as a premise, science is never settled. It's not an encyclopedia of accumulated facts. It's always work in progress. If scientists did not question existing consensus, you'd never have any progress. we would still all be literally believers in a flat earth. So people who question and are skeptical are the ones who drive progress. 
Not yes. all turn out to be right, but it's important to remember that. Absolutely. And that means they must have the freedom to be able to do it. But what happened was, this brings in the censorship industrial complex and the use of media and social media and big tech to impose and enforce the censorship. As a result of which people who were skeptical never realized the extent of support they had amongst fellow scientists. They were deplatformed, they were not allowed to communicate, and they were demonized and vilified. And in many cases, the relevant regulatory authorities and colleges of um, you know, medical associations, etc., came down hard on them as well. And so they feared loss of patronage, they feared loss of research grants, uh, avenues for publication were shut down to them, which had severe career impacts. And most people, therefore, kept their heads below the parapet. Unbelievable. It's unfortunate because I think, we, and what, as I said in the article, there was a card, contagion of cowardice and complicity by the media as well. If they had spoken out, if they had defied, all you need is up to 10% of all doctors saying, no, we do not agree with the official line. We think there's cause for further investigation. And in the meantime, we prefer to leave this to the doctor and patient in the privacy and confidentiality of the clinic. And it's for them to decide based on informed consent, no mandatory coercion by anyone. That would have collapsed, the narrative would have collapsed, and we would have had overall better health outcomes, even on COVID, I believe. Instead, same thing happened with journalists, Ramesh. Same thing happened in newsrooms, right? People were afraid to well, speak out. Adam Crichton from The Australian was one of the few. Um, and, and he, I think you mentioned in your article, he faulted a too credulous, incurious mainstream media naive to the political and financial forces that pushed governments to assume the more sensible path of voluntary COVID-19 vaccination. And yep. he was hammered for it. He was criticised and slammed from all sides. And he, he had to change right. his phone if I remember right. right. I think he was subjected to all sorts of things. Uh, I, I think the one magazine, as it happens, that stood out in the world in this sense was The Spectator Australia. Uh, and, and more kudos to them. But I do think it doesn't help when you've got a billion plus dollar funded government machine, media machine sitting in the middle of the media in Australia, feeding out the propaganda of the state uh, and the line of the state with very little criticism. Well, uh, little just critique. one final comment on that, which is, goes beyond what I said in the article. And that is that what we see across the Western world is essentially a split between the elites and the ordinary people. And elites based in the metropolitan cities and including the educational, cultural, legal, etc. We saw that in, with The Voice uh, and other people out in the country, if, if you like in Australia, the Highlands land. And the elites are in many respects waging a war on their own people and losing. You know, the most recent example, the, the twin referendum in Ireland, the farmers revolt in Europe on net zero, uh, the election of uh, right of center parties uh, in Italy, uh, Netherlands, uh, possibly coming up in Germany, uh, most recently in Portugal. Uh, so I think there is a pushback now. Uh, uh, and what COVID did do was once the trust in institutions fell away, many more people are now starting to look more critically and skeptically at other items on the agenda, including climate change and net zero. Uh, so it, 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 it's interesting. I don't know if you've seen the new movie, uh, uh, Climate Movie. I forget who it's done by, but it, it's got a lot of serious people. It's more than an hour long. A lot of well-credentialed serious people pointing out, going, going back to conspiracy theories, pointing out that there's been a silence, that this 97% scientific consensus thing is a myth and a manufactured myth, deliberately created myth. Well, this is the thing. I mean, modelling... Modelling mistaken for scientific research was, I think, the line you used in the article, right? Mm -hmm. This is modelling, scientific modelling, and people look at the modelling and go, oh, that's the reality. That's the scientific fact, that modelling. Yeah, exactly. That's where the temperature's going to go. That's where the number of deaths... If you look at the modelling from COVID early on, it was completely wrong yep. on many levels. And there's a lot to be said for the fact that the modelling on climate and temperature increase is potentially very, uh, you know, questionable... And yet we're not even having that discussion anymore. We've no. passed that. We've moved beyond that now. It's just accepted. Now we can't even get people to agree to a, a free market of different energy options. <laughs> so that's a, a whole other story. Uh, Ramesh, we are out of time. I could talk to you all day. Wonderful to speak to you. Great to have you on the show. Will you come back again sometime? 
We look forward to that. Thanks, Jamin. Thanks very much for your time. Dr. Ramesh Thakur there on the other side.